when I was, um, bro, one day, the house I grew up in, my parents' house, actually my brother still lives in that house, so it's kind of cool, down in Rivera Beach. Um, there used to be a lady who lived next door to us. Her name was Mrs. Rourke. And for as long as I could ever remember, she was like 97 years old. I mean, one of those old ladies who was just always an old lady. Nice old lady, and I, I don't really remember much. She lived there probably, I don't know, I don't even know how old I was when she moved out, but, but I don't remember like talking to her or things that she did or, or any of that stuff. But what I do remember is that she had in her backyard, which of course was next to our backyard, two big apple trees. And uh, there were some really cool advantages to having a neighbor with two big apple trees when you were a kid. And they were close to the property line, close enough so that the branches kind of hung over the fence. And the cool thing, number one, was that anytime you were outside and wanted an apple, well, you just reached up and grabbed an apple and you could have a little snack. It was, it was those kind of green, I think my mother always said they were pie apples. I, don't, I never knew there was a difference between pie apples and other apples. They were kind of sour green apples, but if you like that kind of apple, it was great. The other really cool thing about the apples was that during the course of the summer, the apples would fall on the ground and they would get really mushy and nasty. And if you're a boy, which some of you are, and some of you are not, or if you've ever had boy children, you know that mushy, round things laying on the ground are awesome projectiles. And me and my brother used to find every way possible to fling, throw, uh, what a hurl. We made like little tree, apple tray bouchets, little apple slingshots, and then there was always to just hide behind the tree in your yard and throw them at each other. <laughs> when all else fails, just throw the apples at each other. Now, it came to pass at some point that Mrs. Ward, I don't remember even if it was because she died or had to go live with somebody else, but she sold the house. Our new neighbors, Doug and Penny, moved in, and a couple of years after uh, Doug and Penny lived there, Doug decided that the trees needed to be pruned. Now, to my knowledge, Doug was not an arborist. Doug had no knowledge of pre-pruning, uh, tree pruning, pre-pruning. My tongue got wrapped around my eye teeth. I couldn't see what I was saying. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so he had no knowledge of tree pruning, and yet he decided that he was going to prune these apple trees. When he got done, there was no more tree than you would see on this table right here. It was literally a trunk and some stubby branches with no leaves on them. Unfortunately, Doug, uh, Doug's pruning efforts uh, ended up with them having to cut down the trees, and they were no more. And you know, pruning, if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not careful, if you do it the wrong way, can have like tragic results. You can make tragic mistakes when you're pruning uh, things like trees and plants. I mean, you know, once they start growing, which you know is a big thing for me, I plant it and it dies. But if it ever gets to the point where you can prune it, you make a mistake, you lose a tree. I mean, they lost two apple trees, but done right. Done right, pruning can have beautiful results. Case in point, see this, this azalea right here, this kind of pinkish orange one, uh, that's in my yard. And uh, it was there when we moved into the house. And from what I understand from the old owners, it was probably 15 to 20 years old when we moved there. So it's a really old school azalea. And at one time, uh, that whole ground cover piece right there in front of it was covered with azalea. It went all the way back to the house and all the way up to where we parked. And it was probably seven, eight feet in, in both directions. It was a huge azalea. And then a couple of years ago, it started not flowering and dying in the middle. And every, you know, two days we would break off this big chunk of stuff until it was just like, we thought we'd lost it. So I did some research. I didn't just dig a hole and plant. I did some research. I figured out that, believe it or not, the easiest way to cure a failing azalea is to cut it to the ground. Now I didn't tell Susie that's the easiest way to cure an azalea. So I went out there one day and cut that azalea all the way to the ground. And she had a fix. She didn't like me after that. She thought it was going. But, but within, now this was two years ago? Two years ago. And, and this is what we have. This is one of the best blooming azaleas we have now. And not only did it come back beautifully, but there were some uh, branches that had started to root and had little runners on them. And I cut those branches off, the ones with the roots on them, and planted those in little pots. Now, two of them we never got around to planting, but we planted one of them. It's in our backyard now, and it's about this big around. So, done right, Pruning can have awesome 
results. I mean, that's what it's there for. You, you kind of endure this little bit of pain to get something good. In the end, now, most of us might not ever um, pick up shears or a saw or, or whatever tool you might use and hack the limb off a tree or prune an azalea. Uh, if you want to do that, come call me. I'll come cut your azaleas down to the ground and so on. We might not ever do that, but, but we do <coughs> prune ourselves often. We do. We endure little tiny bits of discomfort and pain because we think in the end something better is going to come out of it. I mean, just think about school. Now, there might be some of you weird people out there who really like school, but I hated it. I went to school because I had to. I endured this pain, and even when I went to, to college and finished my bachelor's degree just a couple of years ago, I didn't like school, but I did it because at the end, there was some greater good. You endure this. How about dating? How many of us endure the pain of uh, making ourselves out to be something we're really not, just so that we can, you know, impress the person we're dating? Thanks. <laughs> I would never do that. Not ever once. I told you I met my wife at a roller skating ring, so I was really cool, right? I had roller skates on, I, that's, I was out of work at the time too, so that just tells you I wasn't trying to impress anybody. But I digress. How about diets? Diet is certainly a way of pruning ourselves, isn't it? This kind of uh, momentary pain for a better good or working out in the gym, right? How do you think the saying, no pain, no gain, came about? In, in, implying that there must be pain here if we want something better in the end. We go through all of that and we don't, we don't even think anything of it. Even if it's something that's a little painful, we just do it. And, and it's okay with us, but let something happen that we didn't start. Let something from the outside put some kind of pruning action on us. It's a whole different ballgame there, isn't it? I mean, especially when it's something that goes against kind of our internal nature. Something that we love to do or we, we are prone to do, especially when it's something that's kind of, you know, pushing against that. It becomes a little uncomfortable. It becomes a little painful for us. And especially if it's not something we would do to prune ourselves. It's okay if we prune ourselves, but let somebody else do something to us and that's it. But that happens to us quite a bit, doesn't it? I mean, I would imagine that everybody in here has been through some season of pruning in their lives that you didn't start. Something, somewhere along the road, caused some situation that might have been painful or hurtful or, or at the very least inconvenient and uncomfortable. But why does it happen? We talked a lot in the last couple of weeks about um, these situations where life throws lemons at us. Fear and this empty net and stagnation last week. And, and sometimes we can just say, okay, I'll make lemonade. No problem. It makes a lemonade. Sometimes the lemons hit us and it hurts. Right? Sometimes it hurts. And last week I said that uh, we would look for some answers to that question, why do we have to go through these things? Why do we have to go through these periods of pain and discomfort and, and inconvenience and all that? And, and to be honest with you, we're not going to get to all the answers. We can look through Scripture and find many, many reasons why God uses different situations in our lives to do things that He needs to do. But we're only going to look at one answer today. One. And I think it's a big one. And we're still in John 15. Uh, we started there last week. We just read a couple of verses. But we're going to read through all of John 15, chapter, uh, verses 1 to 11 today. And uh, something we need to kind of be cognizant of here is that this occurs right after the Last Supper. I don't think we said that last week. So Jesus had just told his guys, I'm going away forever away from you, but I'll send somebody to help you. And where I'm going, you can't come. And I have to imagine, this is not anywhere in Scripture that you can find. There's no like timetable or, or stage direction that says, and then Jesus and the disciples got up from the table and walked outside into the garden. But I have to imagine that somewhere along the way, they finished eating, they, Jesus had told them this, he unloaded this piece of information on them, and then they kind of got up and left, and the disciples were just like, but Jesus, please, just one more piece of wisdom, just come on, one more. I know you're going, we don't understand why, but just one more. And I have to, in my mind, just imagine that maybe Jesus is now kind of strolling through a garden, a vineyard, with his guys, just giving them one piece more, 
One little tidbit more, because he gives them some great information here. And that's, that's where we pick up, uh, right here in John chapter 15. And I'm reading from the NASB, so if you're using your app or have a Bible, uh, it'll be up here. So let's read through the whole thing, and then we'll dig in. In John chapter 15, verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so that it might bear more fruit. And you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. And these things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Last week, we said that <clears throat> uh, if we realize that God tends the garden and Jesus supplies the nutrients of our life, then we grow. There is a reason why we're planted in God's garden. And when we end up planting ourselves in our own garden, relying on our own strength, then we tend to feel stagnant. And, and, and that's a great idea. And then we read the whole thing. And we realize that, that this whole uh, dissertation from Jesus, what he's saying is, because of that, because God has a purpose, because you are planted in his garden, and he has a purpose for the rest of your life, this is all about how God operates to make that happen. And really, he's talking about four different stages of a believer's life. If we notice, he says, any branch in me that does not bear fruit. Number one, there are believers who bear no fruit. And then he says, and any branch in me that bears fruit. So there are believers who bear some fruit. But the goal is to have us bear more fruit until eventually we bear much fruit. So there's, there's four distinct phases that Jesus is talking about here. No fruit, a little bit of fruit, more fruit and much fruit. And all of us are there somewhere. Somewhere along that scale of no fruit, some fruit, more fruit, much fruit. All of us in here today are along that scale somewhere. If you are a believer in Jesus, he says that, any branch in me. So we know he's talking about believers. The first thing he talks about is no fruit. Now, before we get into a big discussion about what this verse means. I want to say that while I'm not smart, I have read a bunch of evidence that most translations get this wrong. It says, any branch in me who, is, who does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's what it says. It says he takes it away. The word that's used for takes away is the Greek word airo. A-I-R-O. Airo. Now it can be translated two ways. One is, he takes it away. And the other is, he lifts it up. And I read a bunch of stuff on this, on both sides of the issue. And John, in his Gospels, uses this word, airo, more often to say lift up than he does to say take away. And then if we compare this verse to the whole of Scripture, which tells us that nothing can snatch us from the Father's hand, that once we're saved, once we're in Jesus, nothing can change that. That's secure forever. I think the evidence speaks that this verse should really say, any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. I can imagine if in my brain, if that kind of imaginary thing is true, that Jesus walking through this vineyard with his guys. Now, the vine dresser would have, any time a branch would be laying on the ground, he would want to get it up off the ground immediately because it'll start rooting and it'll start digging itself in and it'll be no more good. They'll have to cut it off and throw it away. So the vine dresser would naturally 
pick that branch up and clean it off and put it back up on the trellis. And I can imagine Jesus telling this to his disciples. And as he's going through a vineyard, he just leans down and he says, these branches that bear no fruit, we lift those up and we put them back. And that gives us great hope. Because there are times in every one of our lives when we're just done. We're in this mindset like, why should I do it? Or we're angry with God for something. Or, or we just have spent everything we had and, and our fruit-bearing tank is empty. And we feel defeated. But we have hope because Jesus tells us that even those branches who remain in Him... His father, the vine dresser, will pick them up and clean them off yes. and put them back upright so that they can start on the fruit bearing process again. He does it every time. And if we're honest, I think we get in that place more than we like to admit. Because it's so easy. To get in that place where we're just done. Maybe somebody's there right now. We talked last week about. Um, you know, this feeling of stagnation, like we feel we should be doing something more and we just get in this rut. But God will lift you up. And in his act of lifting you up, if we let him, if we let him, he will give us everything we need. He will enable us and he will stimulate us to start bearing fruit. And that's what Jesus talks about next. Those people who are bearing some fruit, but not enough. And most of us, I think, are here. Most of us, I know most everybody here personally. In fact, I know everybody here personally. Um, that's one of the great things about a small church. And, you know, we're all, so, I've seen everybody do things that will be considered bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. But this is also the place we all hate to be. And we hate to be here because this is the place where pruning happens. This is the place where those painful and inconvenient and uncomfortable and unwanted and unexpected and never at the right time where all those things happen in our lives because Jesus has a plan. He doesn't want us to just bear some fruit. He wants us to bear more fruit. And so he puts all these things in our life. He uses all the situations that happen in normal life so that he can prune us and make us the people he wants to do. We can't move into more fruit without pruning. There's always got to be some pain, some discomfort, some inconvenience to get to the next level with Jesus. And sometimes it's a really painful thing that we can say, I have no idea in the world why Jesus would use that. As Susie has begun to heal and build herself back up and become normal, normal life stuff again. The amazing thing is, even though for years we sat and said, why God would you ever put us through that? The amazing thing is that, that she has now the biggest heart of compassion for anyone who goes through that same situation. And not only that, but God has brought into her life people, time and time again, who are going through the same situation. It may have taken four years to see that fruit, but God had a plan. Sometimes... It's a long time before we see what God has in store. Sometimes it's rather immediate. And it's not even going to be that, that uncomfortable. I was, um, you all know, I was building a shed. Been building a shed now for a long time. And um, so, so here's what happened. You, you all know, as, as a preface, that if you know me, you know that I'm not always the most patient person in the world. I know that's surprising. I know that's surprising, but I'm the kind of guy, like, if I want something, I want it now. And there's, you know, that's just it. So I ordered all the stuff I needed for this shed. And I ordered the doors. And first, it took me, like, two weeks to find the right door. Finally, I ordered the door from Home Depot on April 30th. And when the order completed, they don't tell you this ahead of time. When the order completed, it said, your doors will arrive between May 17th and May 22nd. Two weeks, three weeks. So I said to myself, okay, Chris, you don't need the doors at first. You can't put the doors in until the shed's built. So that'll give you an opportunity to get everything else built, get all the stuff inside the shed without having to worry about the doors. And then the doors will be in on the 22nd. You'll put them in and you'll be done. Well, the 22nd came and went. Um, and I didn't get my doors. 
So, you know, Home Depot has this really cool thing where you can text them now about customer service. The only problem is, is that every time you send a text, it's a new person who answers it. Then you have to give them all your information again. Uh, here's my order number. Here's my name. Here's my address. Here's what happened. And then they say, oh, we can't get hold of the carrier. Finally, after seven days of this, on June 5th, it was Tuesday of this week, the one person on the text said, the doors have arrived at the store. You should be getting an email to pick them up. I'm like, yes, my doors. So the next evening I get an email from Home Depot and it says this, um, order issue. That's the subject matter, order issue. Your order arrived, but unfortunately it was damaged. <laughs> I ended up taking the damaged doors anyway. They gave me a 25% discount, but I'm telling you, there has never been a time of late where God has spoke to me so loud that says, you need to be a little more patient. Because I think that as a pastor, patience is probably something that comes in handy. Amen. And, and there is another pastor in this church who can vouch for the fact that I am not always the most patient of people. I hear you, God, loud and clear. It was uncomfortable. I hated it. But God works that way in our lives. It usually involves something that is very close or relevant into our life. Usually something that we're holding on to. That's why it hurts. Something that's hard for us to give up. Or something that that's terrifies us. Or something that he knows in your weakness he can show his strength. That's why pruning is so painful for us. He has a purpose in our life. We said last week that he has all these things, all these good works already planned out. He knew them before we were even born. He's got them in store. Probably more good works than we'll ever get around to doing in our life. He's got them. He knows what we need and what we don't need to become the people that he's designed us to be. Now last week I told you, I ended and said after this week you're either going to love me or you're going to hate me. So here's the chance where you get to decide. Because here's why. Pruning never stops. God never stops pruning us. He's always working in our lives with something that he needs us to change, something that he needs us to grow into, something in our lives. He's using all these situations to move us to the people he wants. Now, why would he stop? His goal is not fruit. His goal is not more fruit. His goal is much fruit. All the time fruit. Our whole lives dedicated to doing good works in his kingdom. Now, I'm not saying that good works have any way, shape, or form will earn us salvation. What I'm saying is that as children of God, as believers, as, as saved Christians, it's our duty to go out and do good works. That's what we're called to to do. But it always goes back to the same question. It always goes back to the same question. If there is a loving God, if there is a caring God, a compassionate God, if this God really cares for me the way he says he does, why does he punish me by making all these things come into my life? I don't see these things in anybody else's life. Why my life? Why are you punishing me this way, God? I know that you can snap your fingers and make it all go away. Anybody ever been there? Well, I'm going to tell you that God is not punishing you. I know he's been there. Way to go, young Skywalker. He's not punishing us. In fact, just like a parent is not punishing their children when they discipline them or correct them or teach them a different way, God does these things for us because he loves us so much. That he knows what we're supposed to be. He knows what we can become. He knows the potential that's in every one of us. He knows that each one of us have a specific thing in our lives that we are going to be really good at. And he pushes us in that direction every time. Not only that, but if we read the text, and this is really easy to miss. All the stuff about bearing fruit, no fruit, some fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Jesus is careful to say, these are all branches, excuse me, that are in the vine. 
all branches in the vine. He says, in fact, the branches that don't abide in me, <laughs> we cut them up, throw them away, and burn them. Because God prunes you, you can be assured without a doubt that your salvation is secure. Because he wouldn't go through the trouble if he didn't know that at the end of it all, you're going to be standing there right next to him. Truth is, and I know this is going to sound a little weird, <clears throat> God and Satan are both trying to kill us. <laughs> both of them. Satan is always trying to steal us away from that promise of everlasting life. All the time. All the time. And there's only a few ways the Bible says you can, you know, grieve the Holy Spirit enough to be there. But Satan's trying his best. And on the other hand, God is always working to have us die to the person that we were. He's always trying to get rid of that old person and create a new person in us. And that's his promise, that if we abide in him, we will be a new creation. <coughs> God will do anything to have that happen. There is someone in your life right now you don't even have to think very hard that you would do anything for. You would probably jump in front of a bus for them. And that would include things like giving them the hard, brutal, honest truth because you know in the end they'll be better for it. There's somebody in your life that you do that for. And that's what God does for us. He will give us the hard, brutal, honest truth he will use the situations in our life to move us to the people he wants us to be all the time. Not because he's punishing us, but because he loves us more than you can ever imagine. He does all the work in that respect. All the work. But he does want something in return. He wants much food. That's what the scripture says. From us, he wants much fruit. And the only way to get there, Jesus says... Uh, a bunch of times, and we said a couple of weeks ago that if there's ever something repeated in Scripture, we need to sit up and take notice of that. He uses this word abide. I didn't count them, but it's probably seven or eight times. Jesus says, this is the key, folks. This is the key to much fruit. Being so totally sold out, so hook, line, and sinker on Jesus Christ, glorifying the Father with our good works, not to save us, but because we're saved. Being so totally sold out on that, that we get to that point of much fruit. Here's the thing. The key to much fruit is much Jesus. It's the only way, Jesus says, to produce much fruit. If you abide in me, you will produce much fruit. And as painful as it is, we kind of have to force ourselves to embrace this journey. We don't like it. It's not nice. Nobody wants to be in that spot in their lives. But we have to embrace that journey and not back off, which is our human nature. Our human nature is to run away, to retreat, to back up, to close ourselves off, to shut the doors, to hide in our closet, to turn the lights off, and be done with it all. But we can't do that. We have to lean in. We have to move forward. Instead of, instead of complaining about the situations we're in, maybe we could turn and thank God for loving us so much that he has a plan that we don't know about. Maybe instead of retreating and backing off, we can just keep moving forward toward him and lean in for his strength, not ours. Maybe when we're feeling defeated, we can claim his victory. Because the same power that he used to defeat death on the cross is in us. Maybe instead of saying, we don't understand, God, what you're doing, we can dive into his word more. He says that, because of my word, you are already clean. And one of the ways God uses to prune us more often than not is right here in the pages that he handed down, that he breathed, that he gave us. It's right here. If we read, we'll know what God wants for our lives. And then all those things that happen outside of the pages of the scriptures start making more sense. Just like that azalea, God is always pruning us 
He's always working in our lives. His pruning is a way of transforming us and keeping us from withering and always working on us to bear more fruit. And we need to embrace that journey. I wrote no less than four conclusions to this sermon. <laughs> True. Because I really wanted to hit home with this kind of why does it matter point. Why does it matter that we bear fruit? Yes, we, we need to be the people God and designed us to be. He's got good works planned for us. But why does it really matter? And I wrote one and I trashed it and I wrote another one and I trashed it and I wrote another one and I trashed it and I wrote another one and I trashed it. Then I went up to get a different translation of a Bible that I don't read very often. And it was under my bed and I wiped the dust off of it. I do read my Bible, just not that one. And this fell out. And just as a matter of kind of backstory, uh, there were several years, in fact, Paul way many more years than I, than I did, but several years where uh, Paul and I and some other people in this room, in fact, attended uh, an event called the Global Leadership Summit. And the Global Leadership Summit is basically this big event hosted out in Chicago where uh, leaders of faith, leaders in the secular realm, uh, all kinds of, from all walks of life, kind of get together and, and discuss strategies for being better leaders and how to, and, and for us of faith, it's, it's how to uh, be better leaders of our church. And, and in August of 2012, uh, at the closing ceremony, they gave us this. And I'm going to read this. It says, my morning prayer. God, this is a new day. I freshly commit myself to the role you have invited me to play as you are building your church in this world. I am all struck again today that you include me in this grand, life-giving, world-transforming endeavor. So today, I joyfully offer you my love my heart, my talents, my energy, my creativity, my faithfulness, my resources, and my gratitude. I commit myself to the role you have assigned me in the building of your church so that I may thrive in this world, and I will bring it today. I will bring my best because you deserve it. Your church deserves it. It is the hope of the world. Now, if I could ever write a conclusion that says this is why we need to embrace the pruning journey so that God can make us into the people he wants, this would be it. There is no better reason why we need to bear much fruit because God has chosen each and every one of us to be the agent in his plan of redemption for this world. That's right. He's going to come back one day and, yeah, he'll wave his hands and make it all right. But until then, it's not going to happen unless every one of us in this room and in every other room that's meeting right now and in every other part of the world and in every walk of life, if we all embrace Jesus Christ, if we go to much fruit comes from much Jesus, if we become the people that we're supposed to be and we step up to the plate and we get to that point of much fruit and we play our part, in God's plan of redemption for the world. When he says, there are already good works that I have planned out for you, this is what he means. He means that I want to redeem this world, and I can't do it without you. So where are you in that four-step process of no fruit? Fruit more fruit and much fruit. We're all somewhere on that journey. And God has it in his mind, and he always wins, by the way, that we're going to be at much fruit. That's what he wants. Will you embrace that journey? Will you strive to produce much fruit by committing to much Jesus? Abiding in him? And maybe you're at a point where you're like, I don't know Jesus. How do I get on this fruit train? How do I get a fruit basket? And it's easy. 
If you'd like to, if you'd like to know more about that, I, I urge you to just to just come talk to me or Paul or any number of people here today. We'll pray with you. We'll talk about what that decision means when you say, "I am tired of doing this on my own, and I know that I'm powerless in this world without Jesus Christ." Maybe there's someone here in that spot today. Maybe, maybe you believe that, uh, oh, well, I know Jesus, and I know about him, and I know God, and I was raised, and in, in, in my parents talked about God, but you've never really made that decision that says, yes, Jesus, I surrender. I give it all to you. You take over. And I would love to talk to you about that after service. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Um, some of your truths are hard for us to understand. Some of your truths are painful in action, in practice, when you're at that point where you're, you're implementing exactly what you say you're going to do in our lives. And we know that we read your scripture and we say, okay, God, I know you're going to do that, but it still hurts. But also, thank you so much for being a God who is loving and caring and who will give us all the strength we need to get through that, even if it's just dispensed to us five minutes at a time. You promise that you will not give us anything without being with us, in front of us, and behind us. Thank you for those who are here today. And if anybody uh, just wants to make that decision today, God, I hope that you put it on their heart, that you open their heart and just take away the hardness and the, and the, and the vault that is there sometimes and just open it up and let, and let your Holy Spirit penetrate that, that, that God-shaped hole that we all have in our, in our heart. God, I ask that you keep everyone safe until we return again. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. And together as a church, we say, Amen. Amen. Amen.